If you have ever watched an illusionist perform up close magic, you know the power of misdirection and sleight of hand. Even in a room full of suspicious and attentive observers, the illusionist can fool them all by exploiting known weaknesses in the human mind and employing his tools of the trade. He will deceive the crowd whether it wants to be deceived or not. Imagine what an equally talented network of political illusionists can accomplish performing before an audience of mostly trusting and casual observers, exploiting known weaknesses in the human mind and employing their tools of the trade. They too will deceive the crowd, whether it wants to be deceived or not. Welcome to Keith Knight. Don't tread on anyone. Today we have James Corbett of the Corbett Report. Join his excellent website corbettreport.com for just one dollar a month check out his great episodes solutions survival currency and how a global conspiracy can work questions for corbett james uh where is the best place to follow you on alternative social media corbettreport.com just go to my website directly and you can find any links to any of my social media platforms from there but keith i'm not going to let you get away with these cold open intros anymore i'm going to ask you for the source of that quote that you're reading it sounds like it's from the prestige but i'm assuming it's not <laughs> that is from g edward griffin in his introduction to tragedy and hope 101 by joe Plummer. i intentionally don't uh leave uh, <laughs> <laughs> i intentionally don't give authors sometimes because i know Oh, person X? Don't yeah. you know person X talk to person Y? <laughs> exactly. Quote. Yeah, 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 yeah. I get I'm it. I'm not I telling get you it. bastards anything anymore. Um, so, James, thank you for coming on. Today, uh, we're going to talk about three of our red pill moments. Before that, though, I want to say uh, what I think red pilling is. I'm going with Michael Malice's definition. <laughs> Tell me where this falls short, if at all. Red pilling is the belief that what is presented as fact by the corporate press is a carefully constructed narrative intentionally designed to keep some very unpleasant people in power. Uh, uh, I suppose so, but that to me doesn't describe the red pill experience at all. To me, the red pill experience is taking the red pill as in you suddenly start to understand and see and perceive the world in a different way. So it's an action that takes place um, not necessarily voluntarily or consciously, but something that happens that transforms your perception of the world um, to the to the end of what you're saying there about the corporate press and the d deliberately crafted lies. But I think it's the it's more the action of someone going through that process of starting to understand those lies. Great. Uh, he then has four sort of follow up questions that he says, if you answer yes to these, then you ca are categorized as a red pill person. Of course, this is not official, but Malice is who I uh, learned a lot of this from. Number one, do you think Americans as a whole are being uh, misled systematically? Number two, do you think we have been misled since we were in school? Number three, do you think people the people doing this are fully aware of what they are doing. Finally, given the choice, some of these malevolent actors would prefer us dead over defiant. James, are there any go-to questions or sort of litmus tests you will give someone to see if they have sort of uh, embraced this red pill ideology? Absolutely not, because I think that uh, this is not a religious cult. I don't speak, uh, seek some sort of purity, and I don't have, you know, litmus tests and what have you. Uh, there are a lot of people that I talk to whose opinions I respect on certain matters, whose opinions I would not turn to in other matters, who, for example, may, may swallow the 9-11 narrative, uh, hook, line, and sinker, but who may be good on this topic over here, or people who believe in global warming science, which obviously I disagree with, but they're, they're good on this topic over there. So I don't think it's like that. And plus, I also don't think that I am the one who can sit there and be in judgment of other people. Yes, you, I, I allow you, you are red-pilled, but you are not. I am not in a position to do that because I have had a red-pill experience where I realized everything I thought I knew about the world, or at least everything substantial, was wrong. And so I leave that open in my epistemology. I do not know everything in the world, and I could learn something tomorrow that completely changes my view of the world. So I, I don't sit there in, in, in judgment over other people about this. Terrific. Let's go one by one, uh, three of our red pill moments, so to speak. James, start us off with your first red pill moment. All right. I'm going to go back to, uh, I'm going to say this was probably 2004, and I was sitting here in Japan. I was watching the Gandhi uh, biopic, biopic as I like to pronounce it, but that's probably wrong. Anyway, 
uh, starring what's his face, <laughs> Ben Kingsley, right? Uh, that everyone remembers from 1981 or whenever that came out. Um, it, it's the story of Gandhi, etc. Et Hollywoodized, obviously, but anyway, I was watching that and. It got to the scene where in South Africa where uh, Gandhi is leading the protest movement against the identity papers that were coming in for the Indian residents, and uh, they show the, the you know the dramatic scene of this big uh, protest, yeah, protest I suppose in defiance of these identity papers, where um, Gandhi is going up and and burning, throwing the identity papers in the fire in direct defiance of the British, right in front of the British uh, police, um, the MPs or whatever that were there. Uh, overseeing the protest and they say you know they got the clubs in hand we're going to arrest you if you do this and he starts throwing the papers in and they start beating him and he continues throwing the papers in the fire as they're beating him until he literally can't do it anymore and then they drag him away and throw him in jail right and i'm sitting there watching this and in my pocket is an identity card that as a foreign resident of japan i am required by law to keep on my possession at all times and to present to any police officer should they ever choose to ask me for it. And until that moment, sitting there in 2004, watching that scene in Gandhi, it never even really occurred to me that this is something that I should be feeling viscerally un unhappy with, shall we say, that I shouldn't just take it for granted. Oh yeah, there's this card that I have to carry everywhere and have to produce on command. Maybe that's something that I shouldn't be so sanguine about. And, uh, you know, it sounds ridiculous from my perspective here in 2021, but young naive me in 2004 was sitting there watching us going, oh, this is something that people used to really care about. This used to be fundamental. People would be willing to be beaten up and thrown in jail over something like this. And here I am sitting with this in my pocket, not even thinking twice about it. And that led me to start thinking about how the public has been conditioned over the course of several decades into thinking that this is just totally normal, totally nothing to worry about. And uh, I, that was reflected in some of my later work uh, at the Corbett Report. For example, I did a, a report a few years ago, and I won't remember the name of it off the top of my head. I'll throw it in the show notes when I post this to my site. It's uh, something about the uh, you are being conditioned to accept the global ID grid or something like that. And specifically making this point that back when, for example, social security numbers were being introduced in the United States, there were people protesting this. This is, this is government control. They're trying to assign us a number and track everything we're doing. And people were uh, up in arms in protest about this. Fast forward a few decades, who even, oh yeah, of course, I got a social security number, whatever, who cares? And that, that changeover, just seeing that in, and experiencing that in that moment was kind of one of my pre-Corbett report, pre-going down the rabbit hole, pre-red pill, red pills, if, if you will. Unbelievable. Yes, uh, excellent uh, example of how uh, movies can really uh, spark uh, the spirit in something that uh, really communicates a message that just reading books or maybe reading facts doesn't necessarily do. For me, this one was so big because I one of my earliest memories is 9-11. I was at my mother's house. I am in first grade. Uh, she gets a call from her friend turn on the TV. Oh my God, she's from New York. Look at what's happening. And I just, oh my God, I remember my mom screaming and it was horrifying because at that time, uh, both, uh, b both planes had hit. And from then on, it was literally, uh, the good guys, NATO Alliance and America against Al Qaeda, evil people unprovoked for no reason, flew planes into towers, uh, to make sure the U S uh, converts to Islam, something like that, and they stop engaging in uh, philosophy of freedom and embrace uh, oppression and burqas, more or less. This idea that I had always had <laughs> that I never questioned, um, actually, a lot of the aspects are false, but one thing was huge. This was a couple years ago. I uh, found this email from the Hillary State Department document. So this was not her WikiLeaks, but this is from a guy named Jake Sullivan, who was not fired and today is a foreign policy advisor to Joe Biden. On February 12th, 2012, at 9.01, he sent a message saying, see last item, AQ is on our side in Syria. Otherwise, things have basically turned out as expected. Now, what the heck does this mean? 
bit of a rabbit hole, and the rabbit hole was the red pill, generally in reference to Operation Timber Sycamore, a classified weapons supply and training program run by the United States Central Intelligence Agency and supported by some Arab intelligence services such as the Security Force in Saudi Arabia. Launched in 2012 or 2013, it supplied money, weaponry, and training to rebel forces fighting Syrian President Bashar al-Assad in the Syrian civil war. According to U.S. officials, the program was run by the CIA's Special Activities Division and has trained thousands of rebels. President Barack Obama secretly authorized the CIA to begin arming Syria's embattled rebels in 20. 13. Two more sentences. The program's existence was suspected after the U.S. Federal Business Opportunities website publicly solicited contract bids to ship tons of weaponry from Eastern Europe to Turkey and Aquaba, Jordan. One consequence of the program has been a flood of U.S. weapons, including assault rifles, mortars, rocket-propelled grenades into the Middle East's black market. Critics saw it as ineffective and expensive and raised concerns about the diversion of weapons to jihadist groups about timber sycamore-backed rebels fighting alongside Jabhat al-Nusra Front. That is a group known as al-Qaeda in Syria. This also happened with LIFG, the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group against Gaddafi, and they fought alongside al-Qaeda in Yemen against the Houthi government there. If you would have told me in 2001 that, hey, the guys who just did this, who we're going to pin this on, we're going to be fighting alongside of, I literally would have responded violently. I, I mean, that was just so unbelievable for you to say that. That's it, just incredible. The amazing thing is, it's not just one guy. We have Joe Biden at Harvard giving a speech about how uh, it, it was unfortunate. There was no James Madison or Thomas Jefferson. So the people we ended up siding with were friends of Ayman al-Zawahiri. Barack Obama was interviewed by Jeffrey Goldberg in an article titled, As President, I Don't Bluff, and talks about how, you know, we're really making sure to uh, stop Assad because Assad is friends with Iran. Uh, Barack Obama was asked about this by Ben Swan and didn't vigorously say, no, of course not. We're not siding with the terrorists. That's an evil group. John Kerry said, we saw the rise of ISIS, but we thought we could manage in a secret recording. Michael Flynn said this on Al Jazeera. And Michael Scheuer, <laughs> Michael Scheuer, the former head of the CIA bin Laden unit, uh, blew the whistle on this more or less and uh, called for the assassination of Barack Obama. But he's, he's not a great guy overall. He's done terrible things. But the point is, look at all these sources but hey, make sure we're talking about uh, gender pronouns and what happened on January 6th at the Capitol. One of my red pill moments, Operation Timber Sycamore, siding with Al-Qaeda years after 9-11, similar to what they did in Bosnia, Kosovo, and in Operation Cyclone in the 1980s. James Corbett, any comments on that or your <laughs> or, or your next red pill moment? Yeah, no, that's a it's a good uh, pick, and uh, it to me that speaks to the fact that red pills are more effective when they are um, it, they can get red pills past the public or down their throat in a way that they don't even notice them and don't and don't actually become red pilled if they just do it over a long enough time period. So yes, uh, the freedom fighters in Afghanistan in the eighties become the vile terrorists uh, in Afghanistan in two thousand one become the the freedom fighters in Syria in 2012. And uh, most people, most people will know those different pieces of the story, but will not connect them. And if you try to connect those pieces of the story into any narrative other than the one they've been fed, will say that you are a vile conspiracy theorist. So um, it's, yeah, that's it. That's it in a nutshell. Um, so congratulations to anyone with the actual intellectual honesty to look at those pieces of evidence and realize what the real connecting thread is and stare that in the face because I know it's a... It's an intimidating thing. So, uh, yeah, good pick. Should I go on with my next red pill? Let's go to 2006. <clears throat> so, as people might know from my origin story, which I've been over many times, so I won't repeat here, but I, I, 2006 is when I started going down the proverbial rabbit hole in a meaningful way. As I've noted before, I've, you know, I've had various questions and not trusted the official story of JFK and other things for many years, but it was 2006 that I really started to look into 9-11 and all of these other things that became the basis for what became the Corbett Report. Um, and so it was 9-11 that was, I think, that first step into the rabbit hole and then starting to go from there. And I started to find all this hidden history and things that I'd never been taught and all of this. But actually, I think the real penny drop moment, the moment where I, I knew, okay, so, because I, I, I sort of, okay, 9-11 clearly wasn't what they told us, but could it be this vast 
organized conspiracy? How would that work? I had all the types of uh, qualms that people would have when first really con confronting this information. But what really dropped the penny for me, um, I'm going to cite this specifically, although well, I'm not necessarily recommending it at this point. It's been over a decade since I watched this documentary. But The Money Masters, I remember, was the documentary uh, three and a half hours, I believe, that um, goes into a great degree of detail about the monetary history, specifically of the U.S., but I could extrapolate um, uh, as a Canadian in Japan. I, I knew this was a more international plan, but looking specifically at the American history of the American central banking paradigm and how, how the Federal Reserve came about, but also the pre-Federal Reserve history of the U.S. Fascinating history. In fact, there's sort of broader monetary history in there as well. Um, obviously, I hadn't learned any of that in all of my years of schooling. And that, when I started to realize, oh, yeah, okay, the money system itself, the, the central banking paradigm, oh, that's controlled. Oh, okay. And that's when I started to see how these other pieces of the puzzle could fit in. Because, of course, if you control the literal spigot of money, uh, then, yeah, you're going to be able to control all sorts of agendas on a much more structural, deeper level, institutional level, than, um, than this sort of haphazard, there's just people kind of going around. No, 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 the money system itself is a, is a base part of that. So that was the thing that got me thinking about that. And I don't necessarily recommend it because, again, I haven't rewatched that documentary in over a decade now. And I know that there were spurious quotations that were included in there. For some reason, I mean, I, as spurious quotations are kind of a pet peeve of mine. These kind of quotes that get floated around that have no source or are demonstrably not true. Um, but specifically in the banking and monetary history sector, there's a lot of really dubious quotations or quotations that are just flat out false and um, several of them were in the Money Masters documentary so I know, I know at least that much was wrong I also know the Money Masters uh, um, producers and what have you were sympathetic to the idea well yes of course we need a central bank but it should be run by the people aka the government <laughs> so I'm obviously not on board with their ultimate solutions and proposals so again I'd have to rewatch it with that in mind but at any rate for me at that time in 2006 never having been exposed to any of that history or that idea. I never read The Creature from Jekyll Island or any of that kind of stuff before that point. So that was my entree into that, and that's what helped to drop the penny and make me realize the, the sort of bigger picture of what was going on here that ultimately, I think, led to the Corbett Report. Do you have a favorite book on central banking? Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously The Creature from Jekyll Island is a good book. Um... I'm trying to think. I, it, it's kind of disparate. Uh, I, I'm interested. I'm most interested at this point in the Bank for International Settlements, and I've always wanted to do a documentary on that. I've just never gotten around to it. If and when I do, The Tower of Basel um, by Adam Libor will be informative in that regard. It's it's st fairly. I mean, it's uh, it's still mainline. It's still a bit mainstreamy, but it's one of the uh, most in-depth books on the. Bank for International Settlements for a general audience that exists out there. So that's a good one. If there, if you have any recommendations, I'm certainly interested to hear them. Yeah, you know, uh, the first one that I read was, oh gosh, Secrets, not Secrets of the Temple. Um, it was Eustace Mullinson. Eustace Mullen's book on the federal secrets of the federal reserve is the title. And it was reading the footnotes in that, that sort of blew my mind. But I mean, creature from Jekyll Island was so good that I, I would say if I uh, just had to pick one that, uh, it would probably be that it's also fun to read things like, um, uh, the Austrian theory of the business cycle collection of essays by Mises, Hayek, Rothbard, where uh, they talk about how the central bank is the primary cause of the business cycle, the boom and bust cycle. Uh, so those. Um, but yeah, if I had to pick one, it would be the creature. I have yet at to come up risk, with anything better. At the risk of recommending something I haven't read. <laughs> I'm not recommending it necessarily, but I will <laughs> note that I uh, recently purchased a history of the Federal Reserve volume one. Um, that was put together by um, uh, Alan H. Meltzer and has a foreword by Alan Greenspan. <laughs> so it's an interesting book already. But um, apparently it includes a lot of the the sort of the, the meeting minutes and sort of um, uh, things from the early years of the Federal Reserve, the, the board meetings and what have you, some of the internal documents. It goes through some of that. Uh, at least that was the way it was sold to me. And so I was interested. I purchased it. I haven't read it yet, but uh, I, I'm looking forward to delving into that. My second red pill moment. So, little background. In 2008, it must have been, I had been going to my grandparents' house in Sedona, Arizona. And when you're 
gosh, what was I, a 10, 11, and 12, you're, it's hard to appreciate the beauty in the mountains of Sedona, so we just stayed inside. They were a little older, and we had talked politics. I had grown uh, very fond of Barack Obama, seeing him sort of as someone uh, uh, coming in to stop this unjust system of not only uh, racism, but uh, financial injustice, and he was going to come in and make sure uh, that the uh, rules of the game were more fair to use the state as a tool or mechanism to achieve the public interest. Uh, I was a very big Obama supporter in 2008, as much as you can be when you're young, but that was something I was really interested in. So in 2000, uh, let me see the date on this PolitiFact article. December 12th, 2013, PolitiFact's lie of the year. If you like your health care plan, you can keep it. PolitiFact lists 37 instances where Barack Obama or someone in his administration referred to the health insurance changes under the, Infor under the Affordable Care Act, something to the extent of, if you like your plan, you can keep your plan. As a causal result of the implementation, between four estimates range between four and nine million Americans lost their health insurance. Now, assisted by this, you have Jonathan Gruber at MIT who wrote a children's book for the Affordable Care Act, Health Care for Kids or something ridiculous, who said that it was uh, mainly the ignorance or the stupidity of the American voter because, I mean, you just can't pass the law by saying we're going to have sick people, you know, give money and we're going to have healthy people give money and pay for sick people. But the point was, this was by far Barack Obama's biggest domestic uh, policy uh, item on the agenda. It was something I had really poured my heart into, and it was a lie. Now, things happen, accidents happen. Uh, maybe he didn't read the bill or something happened that was out of his control. We didn't get a large-scale apology for something like this. You bump into someone at the grocery store, you apologize. So when my hero does not apologize for one of the biggest mishaps, what I thought at the time. It's more or less he didn't care, uh, much like you know they don't care about civilian casualties in war or businesses that go out of business as the result of regulation and overinflation of the money supply. He just did not respond to this. Now, I don't expect people to immediately understand that war and collateral damage are euphemisms for mass murder and funding the military-industrial complex. Taxation is theft, the draft is slavery, regulation is violently dominating one group by another. That's difficult. When you, you, you should be able to process this. He says you're able to keep it. As a cause or result of his plan being implemented, you don't get to keep your plan. A and B want to make a voluntary exchange. C coercively comes in, lies, and takes away what A and B had voluntary voluntarily arranged. So I am still probably uh, the, using the same arguments I had all the way back then at heart, uh, the my body, my choice arguments. I just extended them into the commercial realm, certainly when it comes to uh, medical decision making, the my body, my choice is paramount with regards to vaccines. So this was just so big for me because it was my hero sort of letting me down, the people not holding him accountable, it being very obvious, easy to process, and he doesn't go to jail. I mean, if if I'm suspected of fraud at my you know regular job, I could sort of get in trouble. I might get fired. He was never put on trial. He was never, uh, you know, he goes around telling us about how dangerous it is to question, you know, things like the 2020 election or how dangerous it, it is to engage in whatever voter suppression while he engaged in health care suppression. That is my uh, second red pill. James, uh, comments on that or uh, final uh, red pill? Yeah, no, it's a, it's an interesting choice. And I think that's something that a lot of people can can relate to. Obviously, there's a lot of um, th things to take into account. And as a Canadian in Japan, I've obviously I've I know a little bit about the American healthcare situation and that kind of stuff, but obviously doesn't affect me personally. But I think just on the broader philosophical level, I I find myself in disagreement with probably most mostly everyone, <laughs> almost everyone on this, because uh, yeah, what 
I mean, the the debate, even the debate that's going on in America between, you know, Obamacare versus whatever the alternative may be, of course, is within the controlled paradigm of state, the state capitalist system that's controlled by the central bank with its fiat money, etc. Of course, there is no free market at this point. And I, I, I think a genuine free market in healthcare is what is needed and would be the only thing that would actually um, benefit the most number of people. And uh, it, this is one of those issues where people have to look back to the past. You know, you know the, the governments of the world didn't used to run these medical systems and, and steward over them, uh, socialized healthcare in any sort. How did people possibly get by before? Oh, mutual aid societies, right. But they all went out the window because all of these medical institutions came in and these socialized healthcare things came in and, oh, we don't need mutual aid societies anymore. Now we're going to do it through the government. And uh, it, to me, obviously, that was a, a massive step in the wrong direction. Anyway, um, interesting choice. For my third red pill, I'm going to cop out a little bit because I don't know if I can pinpoint a moment um, per se, but I would say uh, I'm going to move straight up to 2020. And what could I possibly be red pilled about in 2020? I, I guess it isn't necessarily that this is a 100% totally new revelation to me, but the something that was really hammered home to me last year and uh, it is only being further and further confirmed the further into this COVID-1984 nightmare that we goose step is that this, that the public truly, truly is not governed by any sort of rational calculation or consideration of any actual data. That is not how these these things work. And that is not how we're going to get ourselves out of this situation. The public has essentially been conditioned to... It, it, it's, it's functioning... What has happened in the past year is essentially the exact same as the old Salem witch trials or whatever. The mass panic goes about, about the boogeyman. And the boogeyman takes many different shapes. In this case, it's the invisible enemy as Trump turned it, the, the virus, of course, that, you know, it's out there, it's going to get you. And, uh, and and when we're threatened by the boogeyman, we need the, the witch doctors to come along with their ooga booga, and people will be, oh, okay, now, we, now we're saved. And obviously, I think the social engineers know that this is how society operates. It has nothing to do with data and facts and figures. It has to do with the ooga booga of the witch doctors. So they're coming along with their ooga booga of the vaccine. And the vaccine is this magical talisman that's going to save everyone. It's your ticket to freedom. And literally, the vaccine manufacturers say, I mean, even the manufacturers say, this hasn't been tested about stopping infection or stopping transmission. It has nothing to do with that. It's only about reducing symptoms. You're going to have to continue to wear masks and social distance and everything else we say after you take your vaccine. But people are like, yay, the vaccines, they're what's going to save us. And uh, of course, this is also f similarly reflected in the fact that um, I see this reflected everywhere online in the online discussion. And I think we should also always, always take into it with a huge grain of salt what we're reading online because there are bots and there are social media nets that are employed by various military and intelligence agencies to convince people of various narratives. But certainly one of the narratives that is being pushed online is that whenever there is an outbreak or a, oh, you know, whatever, any anything that's going on, it's because you guys weren't masking up. Not everybody in 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 the world is masking up and staying six feet apart at all times. Therefore, it's going to get worse and we're going to have to do this even longer. You're the ones to blame. And the only thing that can save us is a vaccine. So again, there isn't a specific moment and it's not even necessarily a new revelation, but just the power of that revelation has really been hammered home that this is not about facts and figures. You are not going to rationally argue with someone who has not been rationally argued into this position. And that suggests that the only way out of this is for us to present our own witch doctor Uga Booga ticket to freedom that will somehow in the minds of the general hoi polloi be that oh okay now we have the thing that will save us and it's not going to be rational and it's not going to make sense but we need that whatever that is and obviously not an injection not an experimental medical injection but something that will make people feel that the the boogeyman has been dispelled so if there's anyone in the crowd with answers of exactly how to do that i'm certainly all ears Oh, yeah. It's it's so funny. Just trying to think of the boogeymen recently. So in my lifetime, boogeymen that I've heard, 
acid rain, the ozone layers going away, global cooling, global warming, overpopulation. This madman, David Koresh, can't be reasoned with, sorry, we got to go murder 80 children. Uh, I'm sorry, 80 people, including 20 children. We have a uh, crazy guy, Saddam Hussein, can't be reasoned with, obviously have to go in there. Look, Bashar al-Assad is on camera murdering the Kurds for no reason. I'm sorry, wait, it, that's a video from a Kentucky shooting range? Never mind. Either way, he's still a crazy guy who can't be reasoned with. Uh, it's these enemies. They just have no credibility, and they want me to take this vaccine. The same people are telling me. It's the, literally the same Democrats and Republicans. Um, yeah, that, uh, that that's excellent. Always. And, uh, sorry, can I just – I, I just got a runner-up red-pilled because you, what you just said there actually sparked something when you said the ozone layer because I remember, obviously, as a young child and growing up in the 80s, I was all over the ozone layer. You know, we're all going to die of acid rain. Ah, the ozone layer, the ozone layer. And then I remember I was probably like 12 or 13 years old and I was watching the news with my dad one night and just as like this little 10 second little news sting between different stories, they're like, and the ozone layer appears to be healing itself in another news. <laughs> and it was just, I remember turning to my dad and going, wait, what? Isn't that the thing we were all supposed to be freaking out about the existential threat to humanity for the last decade? And they're just like, oh, and it seems to be healing itself. We don't know why. Anyway, <laughs> and I, I remember at that time thinking, Oh, I see. They're they're playing tricks on us, aren't they? So that was kind of a red pill moment in my young, young days. <laughs> good catch. Good catch. Finally, for me, there was a paper in the Journal of Libertarian Studies published in 1990 by a University of Las Vegas, Nevada professor, Hans Hermann Hoppe. And he said in this, we have to understand the ideology of Marxism. You have countries like China, North Korea, uh, former uh, Soviet Union. This has uh, been an ideology embraced by a lot of people across the planet. So this is a good rule of thumb for anything, not just Marxism. Instead of shying away from this evil, terrible thing, well, maybe if you look into it, it'll take away this scariness that it actually has, and you can understand and refute and address the foundational criticism. So he gets into the foundational agreement between Marxists and libertarian voluntarists. Now, this is rather interesting. He says there are five primary points to this exploitation agreement. One, there is a small parasitic unjust ruling class ruling over the masses. Number two, the ruling class is ideologically held together by its interest in keeping the system of exploitation ongoing. Only an increase in class consciousness by the exploited can remedy this. Rulers never willingly retreat or give up power. Number three, an ideological superstructure, media, education, advertising, courts, a property rights system, police, exists to keep the ruling class in power. Number four, the ruling class has an inherent tendency to be corrupted, concentrated, and centralized. Finally, inherent corruption plus more centralization results in more instability, resulting in a crumbling of the system, giving a potential rise to a mass realization by the exploited that an unjust system of exploitation should be replaced by a system of cooperation and mutual benefit. He says this is why this poisonous ideology has gone viral uh, across so many countries across the planet, not because every Marxist is an evil idiot. Look, there's a reason that a lot of people uh, buy into this. And maybe if I had been born into a different geographical area or different time or different place, I would have, with the best of intentions, uh, advocated the ideology of national socialism, uh, fascism, Marxism. So by addressing something and finding the root uh, claim that it's being made and realizing that there is some truth in an ideology that I don't know, hundreds of millions of people have believed in. The disagreement lies in who are the exploiters and who are the exploited. Marx said it's more or less anyone, it's hard to really come up with a principal definition. He, of course, called them capitalist people who acquire money without effort. He then does a very poor job of explaining uh, what it means to really work or provide value. He doesn't address the fact that value is subjective. Some people value some things more than others. The fact that I put a lot of labor into something does not mean other people will value it. He doesn't go into the amount of 
uh, time it takes to come up with an idea of what to sell, when to reinvest money, where to locate your factory, who to sell to, in what quantity, at what time, in what places. So uh, it's false. The point is that he, uh, that uh, Hans Hoppe is able to summarize this ideology better than every Marxist professor that I've ever had at universities. 17% of the social science professors are identified at Marxists. Hans Hoppe was able to go face the belly of the beast and really come out with an explanation of here's why it's attractive, here's a general understanding of it, and here's why it's wrong. So uh, that to me was just so vitally important. So, so often we can uh, you know, hate something, but it's hard to really uh, pin why we hate it. I don't like, you know, this this Trump guy. I mean, his tweets are just so terrible. Oh, he's the worst. It's like, did you see the number of civilians he racked up last year uh, in office with uh, with his mass murder weapons? And they're not really interested in that. Well, because that gets back to you know people finding their identity in uh, in politicians. But um, being able to face an idea find out what's really wrong with it. That to me was uh, so uh, vitally important. James, any thoughts uh, on that? That's a, that, no, that's a good and valuable red pill because I, I think there's probably still a lot of people listening in this audience who would serve uh, to, to, it would serve their interests to actually be better informed about the things that they believe that they are opposed to maybe maybe they are maybe they aren't maybe they are in certain ways but not in others and uh again speaking back back to what i was talking about earlier is that we shouldn't be on some high horse in judgment and of things that we've never read so at the very least if you're going to th presume to know about marxism you should probably read some marx and i say this as someone who minored in philosophy in university i had the marx angles reader heavily highlighted and footnoted which unfortunately got thrown out with a lot of my or sold off uh, along with a lot of my own old uh, university books when I moved over to Japan. But uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've read it and I, it, it's true. There are certain aspects of the Marxist critique of the system that are valid. Um, and class warfare, I, 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 broadly speaking, certainly not the way that Marx defined it, but something like that, I, I think, pertains to my understanding of what we are facing. It is the 0.00001% who have their control of the money supply against the masses of humanity. But I don't, I think the exploitation aspect of it is the wrong way of framing it, um, because I think ultimately it is... Uh, certainly it's the ideological superstructure, the, the control of the educational institutions and the media, etc., that, that program people to believe that their interest lies in this or in that avenue, whereas their interest may really lie over here. And so we ultimately spend our life and our energy and our time and our money and our efforts in the creation of a system for the benefit of that very, very small class. I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd call that exploitation because I think that brings with it certain um, certain ideas, and also it 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 uh, impl implies certain prescribed ideas of what the way that we should solve this problem by overthrowing the the ruling class and taking over their stuff and distributing it to everyone and all of that kind of stuff. Whereas no no no, what we need to do is create our system using our time and our money money and our energy and our efforts, which are the things that created the system that's enslaving us right now. So I I, I definitely have different ideas of. Um, where we go from that, but there are valuable parts of that critique that, at the very least, people should people should have read it if they're going to try to critique it. So, um, yeah, I agree very much with that idea. Um, speaking of which, I haven't read that Hoppe essay, so I'll be interested to to read it. Yeah, he basically says, uh, yes, there are exploiters. It's not who you think they are. The exploiters are anyone who engages in involuntary or uh, violent interaction. These would be non-contractors, non-homesteaders, uh, people not uh, advocating for mutually beneficial exchange in society. They're advocating for a uh, any uh, ability to reach their desired ends by using coercion and not focusing on consent. So whether it's um, the local thief or a rapist or a serial, a serial killer or the politicians on, on all these levels of society, they're both engaged in initiating violence against what would otherwise be people peacefully associating, disassociating, trading, using reason and incentives uh, to, uh, to achieve their ends in uh, society. So, um, the uh, narrative that uh, you were speaking about earlier, you have said that narrative is the most powerful weapon in the world. Could you please expand on what you mean by, you know, I think of the most powerful weapons in the world. I think of 
well, what if I had a bunch of nukes? Then I could just, you know, more or less control other people. What is it about narrative specifically that makes it such a powerful weapon that we need to understand if we're going up against people who understand the importance of this weapon? Well, in fact, that I think speaks both to my third third red pill and your third red pill. But um, that's exactly what I was trying to hit on with with that idea that people are not being driven by rational or generally speaking are not rational. They're not being driven by facts and numbers. They're being driven by the story of the boogeyman and the witch doctors that are coming down the priest class to save the day with their magical talisman. And think about the incredible power of that narrative because 18 months ago, it would have been unthinkable that you had half or more of the entirety of humanity locked down in various degrees, sometimes literally locked down inside their own homes, unable to have people over for conversation or anything. Uh, the kind of absolute madness. Let us not normalize this madness that is taking place still right now would have been utterly unthinkable 18 months ago because their narrative that we've been fed and which we a lot of people have have swallowed wasn't uh wasn't being deployed on the on the public and so if you had tried to do that suddenly 18 months ago violent resistance of course there would have been violent resistance popular widespread resistance now after people have been two weeks to flatten the curve and all of the other garbage that we've been fed for the past year now, people will, not everyone, but a large section of the public will voluntarily lock themselves inside their own home and snitch on other people who aren't doing that. You're, you're killing grandma. They, they have been programmed through this narrative to do things that would have been literally unthinkable on a mass scale. Billions of people now have been reprogrammed, essentially, through a narrative that has been fed to them through the media, through these organizations, through their politicians, through the education system. And that, to me, is power. The power to make billions of people do something that would have been unthinkable even a few short months ago is genuine power. And that's the kind of power you can't, you can't do it with guns. You can't do it with guns alone. People pointing guns at people and saying, stay in your home. There would be resistance. But do it with a narrative and you can get a large percentage of the population on board with it. And that should be terrifying in a certain sense and should also point to the fact that we have to be playing on that level of narrative. That the setting the narrative is really the fundamental power that we have as human beings. And establishing narratives... Uh, towards what we want, rather than just letting these narratives soak over us. We have to be conscious of the fact that we are being programmed every time we're hearing these ideas and these stories on the news or anywhere else. And uh, unless we take control of that power of narrative, then the game is lost. And that's precisely why they are cracking down so hard right now on social media and everything else. That's precisely why they were talking about this in Event 201 in October of 2019, talking about the next global coronavirus pandemic and how they're going to have to flood the zone with information and uh, the various governments are going to crack down on the internet, etc. Uh, they, Of course, this is what they think about because they know the incredible power of thought and narrative and people talking and creating their own stories. We can't allow that. And that's why they are cracking down so hard right now. And that's why we have to support independent out outlets that are helping to spread this information and to, to demonstrate en masse, like we saw this past weekend, of people sh showing you are not alone. There are other people out there that understand and agree. And uh, I think that's an extremely important part of this puzzle as well. Thank God, yes. Very risky when you don't have people in the modern day tavern, so to speak, where they're interacting. Well, what they do is they act on it. They talk to people on social media. But what if the social media is so heavily controlled by the tech giants that you're not able to accurately get vitally important information across? Well, then it's almost as though not only are you not getting some sort of confirmation bias? Oh, yeah, I'm not the only one. It's OK to talk to someone without wearing a mask if we're in our 20s 30s 40s and you know we're uh we don't uh, have these terrible symptoms um so uh yeah you don't get that social proof or that social reinforcement that you would get outside so they get you on social media and then control and close people off on social media um now, uh, someone might be looking at uh, your excellent archive of work, CorbettReport.com, become a subscriber for just $1 a month, and they might say, ugh, this is so overwhelming. 
I am in a world of 7 billion people. I am just one person. I have all this information. The people I talk to just call me a crazy conspiracy theorist. You said at the end of your excellent documentary, Meet Bill Gates, that ideas spread like a virus. What does it mean that ideas can spread like a virus? Well, uh, interestingly enough, my very first podcast of 2020, back before we were being told that uh, coronavirus was the new existential threat to humanity and before it had become what it became, my very first podcast was on going viral. And I would invite people to rewatch that if they haven't uh, or if they haven't seen it in a while or watch it for the first time, um, because I was specifically making the point that this idea that ideas go viral, that memes on the Internet can go viral, which, of course, has just entered the lexicon. Everyone now knows what a meme is and everyone knows the idea of going viral. But I think it's kind of I mean, I certainly understand the point. It's like something that's infecting the body politic and spreading around and creating massive change. But I, at the time, I was saying, well, we probably don't want to associate this type of information with virality because that will ultimately, the metaphor acts unconsciously, again, not rationally, but unconsciously on people's psyche to think, oh, this is an invader. It has to be dealt with. We need medicine to get rid of this viral idea. So I don't think we want to associate with that. And at the time I was saying, well, I, I would like to think of it more as something like going em embryonic, as in we're gestating, we're creating some sort of new idea that will give birth to some new system. That's that's more of the metaphor that I want. Obviously, it's not going to, that going embryonic is not going to go viral. <laughs> but I just don't want people to consciously un understand that. So that that's the idea of virality. It spreads around this something new that's kind of taking over the system. Anyway, I think people understand that. Um, and you're right, um, looking at the archives of Corbett Report or any of these other independent media outlets that people are discovering, especially if they're just discovering it in the past year because of all the craziness that's going on, it is incredibly overwhelming, which is why I would suggest people hone in on the thing that they are most interested in and try to try to do more of a deep dive on that and use that as a uh, as a way to sort of spread out and find some of the other work. So, for example, if you're interested specifically in this scandemic craziness, why don't just type the word pandemic into my search bar and start looking at the swine flu coverage I was doing over a decade ago and medical martial law, which I was talking about in 2008. And you'll find links to the Ebola crisis and Zika crisis reports that I did and all of that, which serves to make an incredibly interesting background to what it, we've seen take place over the past year. And from there, you'll find links to all sorts of other reports that I've done on other topics that might be interesting f for you. And I think that's the best way to try to get a handle on this. Uh, I always say when people are trying to share this information with others, know what that other person is interested in and try to cater towards those interests. Because some people are interested in health, some people are interested in science, some people are interested in history, whatever. Find what they're interested in and try to feed them that. I think that'll be the most fruitful way for them to start to discover this information more generally. Final question for you. Who is more responsible for alternative media sites not getting more attention and the truth getting silenced on social media? Big tech politicians or viewers who don't take two minutes to go create an account at odyssey.com or bitshoot or minds or archive.org? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Uh, yeah. Uh, ultimately, I'm going to say it's the people who uh, do not take the time to understand the choices that are out in front of them and do not take make the effort to uh, try to find this information in alternative ways. I'm going to put it on you, you out there who are watching on YouTube. <laughs> You're the problem. No, obviously, I mean, it is an interconnected system of problems, but ultimately, again, like Marxism or whatever else, it's relatively easy to critique and identify the problems, much more difficult to understand what the real solution is. And I think the real solution here Again, uh, people are going to be led down the garden path of, we'll let the government, it should be a government agency that administers these big tech sites. And, oh my God, they're censoring me for, you know, 9-11 truth or something. Who would have thought the government would do that? No, First Amendment. Uh, you know, whatever. It, that's not going to be the happy solution to this. No, fundamentally, we need to understand the very architecture of where we are right now and where it's heading and what we can actually do about that. And yeah, things like, Odyssey and Bitchute and Minds and whatever are good first steps, at least off of the YouTube system. But 
uh, uh, there's still problems with each and every one of those alternatives. Um, I mean, for example, odyssey.com is just the web-based front end for the library network. If you're not using the library desktop app, then you are not Mm -hmm. actually participating in the library network. And what you see on odyssey.com can and will be censored at some point. And they have various filters that they'll apply and they will censor information off of odyssey.com. It will still be available on the library network, but you have to be actually on the app, part of the decentralized network to use that properly. It's like so many of these things. Yeah, here's the easy way in, but the easy way in is generally gonna be a centralized, controlled, censorable platform. And so we have to start thinking about this more structurally, looking at things like the library network rather than odyssey.com or looking at IPFS or other uh, peer-to-peer solutions to this or the Fediverse instead of instead of Telegram. Let's give them our phone number so that we can sign up for this other centralized service that pinky swear, we're not going to censor you guys. Uh, no, how about we, we actually create our own servers and we, we decide who we, uh, what networks we participate in and how we do that. Again, it's a lot more work. Yeah, it's going to take time and effort to educate yourself on this. But, I mean, look back for those who are old enough in the audience to remember. I feel like an old timer now. Uh, how old are you? You're like 15 years old or something. <laughs> but uh, look back to the 90s, for those of you who can remember, when you didn't know about email and you'd never surfed the web before, you had to learn all of these things and you learned it over a period of time and uh, you didn't, you weren't born with a YouTube account if you were that old. Uh, you had to, uh, at some point, you signed up for it. You, you made the effort to learn about these things. Well, we're going to have to make that effort to learn about the real solutions and there's no alternative. So Yes, big tech, politicians, all of that, of course, are this, the hive of scum and villainy that are our mortal enemies um, that are trying to keep us from this information. But we only have ourselves to blame if we don't take the time to learn about the real solutions here. If human beings are so careless, stupid, and malicious that they cannot be trusted to do the right thing on their own, how would the situation be improved by taking a subset of those very same careless, stupid, and malicious human beings and giving them societal permission to forcibly control all of the others? Thank you for watching Keith Knight, Don't Tread on Anyone, and the Libertarian Institute. Thank you to James Corbett, CorbettReport.com. Thank you.